One moment, please. Thank you for calling Humana. May I have your name, please? Juniper Curtis. How may I help you today? Basically, I'm transgender in, in Florida, so we just had the uh, Medicaid ban and was trying to figure out what's covered now, what's not, and that kind of thing. Juniper Curtis is 23 years old and working for a software company to put herself through college, where she's studying psychology. Oh, well, there's a ban on authorizations for... For transgender patients. Transgender yeah. Okay. It doesn't show me that it's um, been banned, but it does show me it's unable to display any alternatives at this time. Juniper came out as trans two years ago, and shortly after, started treatment that doctors use to help patients who experience gender dysphoria, the overwhelming disconnect between their gender identity and sex assigned at birth. I tried so hard for so long to make what people thought I was supposed to be work. I decided instead I would just uh, attempt to end my own life and sort of came to the acceptance that it couldn't be that worse to, to go through trying to transition, no matter how like hard it would be. What was it like when you started hormones? As close to, to magic as I think anything can be. Within a, a day or two of, of being on them, just everything felt correct. On August 21st, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' administration cut all Medicaid coverage for gender-affirming care, the very treatment that Juniper describes as magic. They talk about these very young kids getting gender-affirming care. They don't tell you what that is. Gender-affirming care includes a range of treatment. Before puberty, it's just counseling. Then for some patients, hormone blockers, which pause the production of testosterone or estrogen. After that, some undergo hormone therapy, which adds replacement hormones to help with the transition. And eventually for some, sex reassignment surgery. Can you afford hormones without Medicaid? If it was just that, maybe. But I have to get, you know, doctor's appointments and blood work every three or four months. That adds up. And I also was fairly far along in the very lengthy process of getting surgery approved. And then this happened, and so it was, it was crushing. What would it mean to you to be able to get that surgery? It would make me feel complete, make me feel safe, make me feel comfortable in the world around me versus this sort of ever-present feeling of just one thing being off. Up until recently, Florida was one of 27 states that explicitly provided Medicaid coverage for gender-affirming care, care which nearly every major medical organization agrees is life-saving. But with increasing anti-trans rhetoric, legislation, and non-traditional policies, lawmakers are doing anything they can to strip health care from the trans community. Eight other states already ban government funding for this care. Dr. Michael Haller, chief of pediatric endocrinology at the University of Florida, testified against this ban. How would you describe this new rule? This new rule is, is a political attack um, on a marginalized population that's being used purely for the purposes of stirring um, a base. It's cruel and unusual punishment for a group that's done nothing other than try to exist and survive. It puts people in a situation of having to choose between you know, buying food or paying rent or buying their medication. After lawmakers refused to outlaw gender care for trans youth, the Surgeon General petitioned the Board of Medicine. This is a group of 15 doctors appointed by the governor who set the standard of care in the state. They agreed to start a rulemaking process, which could ban gender-affirming care for all trans kids, regardless of their insurance. You're supposed to be here to protect us, and instead you have our kids commit suicide. I'm a mom. I'm a parent. I'm a provider. You do not do this to children. You do not do this to children. The state has doctors, including endocrinologists, who testify on, on their side. Who are these doctors? Well, in the case of the Medicaid decision, the state has very clearly selected physicians who are anti-trans. Um, and are not representative of the larger population of pediatricians, um, specifically for their review. When you bring those folks to the table, that is clear you don't actually care to have a conversation. You just want to push your particular viewpoint forward as fast and as hard as you can. Advocates like Nicole Parker with Equality Florida are already seeing the impact of this ban on the community. Of the trans people who you're talking to who have now lost their coverage, 
what are they going through right now and what are they saying to you? A lot of folks are distraught. A lot of folks are like, what am I going to do? Do I need to leave the state? Do I need to go back to black market hormones? Taking away healthcare is not going to stop folks from being trans. It's just going to cause them to find different ways to get the care that they need. Do you know anyone who's had to go to the black market for drugs? Myself, absolutely. In the beginning of my transition, I didn't know how to access healthcare. There were times I was taking too much estrogen and I would get really, really dizzy. I would get really, really sick. There were times I couldn't even get out of bed. There were some times where I would stop taking estrogen because I would run out and then your levels drop and then you get depressed. I couldn't go to a doctor and it makes me very scared for people. We're starting to see the suicidal rate go up. And what I mean by that is folks who are feeling suicidal, folks that are calling us and saying, if I'm not able to access this care, I don't know what I'll do. Several organizations are preparing to sue the state of Florida over the ban on Medicaid coverage. Politicians who have no earthly idea what the kind of medicine we're talking about are trying to dictate what we can do. When politicians are telling you, you can't treat your patients, do you ever think about the Hippocratic Oath? I think about the Hippocratic Oath every day. <laughs> Doing nothing can be extremely harmful to patients. We don't do nothing when somebody comes into our office with a new onset of type 1 diabetes. They would die if we didn't give them insulin. We don't do nothing when somebody comes in with a malignancy. We treat them with chemotherapy or they would die. So similarly, when somebody comes in with gender dysphoria that's bad enough that they are having suicidal ideation or they can't live their best life, doing nothing is not an option. I'm Michael Learmonth, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.